next speaker is an indigenous rights advocate um, and a member of the, and representative of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, Treaty 8 of Northern Alberta. Her nation is the one currently challenging the expansion of the biggest industrial project in the world, the Alberta Tar Sands. Ariel Tsekwia Deranje is a founder of Indigenous Climate Action, which is a national organization for a united indigenous response to climate change. She's also worked with the Sierra Club, Rainforest Action Network, and the United Nations Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. Please welcome Ariel Tsekwia Deranje. There's a mark on the floor for me to stand. Um, I, I do use a little bit of humor, so um, just bear with me, because I'm not actually that funny. Iklanete, dene sutlane huche, Ariel Tseekwe Derange, ta, masicho. My name is Ariel Tseekwe Derange, and I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. And first off, I want to recognize that Montreal sits atop of the traditional territory of the Ganawage and Ganastage people and that I want to thank them for allowing me to be here today. I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, First Nation also known as the Kaitale, the Kaitale Dene Sutlene, which translates to people of the willow. We live in an area that's now known as Northern, Northern Alberta, but our people refer to as Denende. The recognized territory of my people also lies within a UNESCO World Heritage Site known as the Wood Buffalo National Park. The very identity of our people, the Dene Sutlene people, Kaital Dene Sutlene people, comes from the land. It is a core component of our identity, our cosmology, and who we are as a people. I just wanted to start off with that so you know who I am. Now, 2016, the, the, the content of this show kind of brought me back to where are we right now? It's 2016, and it's been a bit of a crazy year. It's been just over a year since we've seen the election of, li of the Liberal government ushering in Trudeau and ending over a decade of harperdom. Many of the radical left was beginning to soften into the idea that there was finally light at the end of the tunnel, that we were going to see real progressive change. I mean, Trudeau made bold promises of regulatory reform, climate action, and respect and implementation of the rights of Indigenous peoples. However, these emboldened promises have fallen short. In the last few months, the hope held by so many is being deflated. More tar sands projects are being approved. With the largest ever proposed open pit tar sands mine, the Tech Frontier Mine, upstream from my community, set for public review in 2017. LNG projects and pipelines have been approved in BC, and the highly contested Site C Mega Hydro Dam in British Columbia has also been approved. All of this done without the promised regulatory reform or the implementation and respect for the rights of Indigenous peoples. To add insult to injury, Trump wins the US election. And this sends throes of Americans and Canadians alike into a zombie-like stupor of despair, many proclaiming, how could this happen? As an Indigenous person who has been working on both sides of the colonial borders of Canada and the US, I was both taken aback, but sadly, not surprised. Daniel Quinn once wrote that the new world fell not to a sword, but to a meme. This couldn't be more true. The ideologies that have permeated this country have changed how we interact with it. Humanity is walking towards the brink of extinction, and we're happily and wildly cheering our leaders to guide us over the edge. Those of us that see the plunging cliff sides are pleading with the people to stop the march and desperately trying to stop the entire brigade that's leading them. Sadly, even those of us who are trying to stop this mass exodus are taking the same steps in the same direction to our own end. So what drives this mindless march? I'm going to propose it's an illness, an illness of the mind rooted in a form of cannibalism. Now hear me out. I'm not talking some mystical leftist conspiracy level BS, but something grounded if we review history and it, that is 
rooted in an analysis of science and that if given the time to understand, we would understand it's perpetuated in our everyday lives. The first time I came across this idea was within the book Columbus and Other Cannibals by Jack Forbes, written in the 70s. He related cannibalism and indigenous cosmology and stories of the Witigo to, this, to what we're seeing in present day. The Witigo is an Algonquin word and is the name of a spirit that is driven by greed, excess, and the desire to consume, to be stronger and better and richer and more powerful than everything and anything else. The Witigo eats all the animals and all the plants and eats man to gain its power. Forbes eloquently framed the Witigo disease and colonization together when he stated, tragically, the history of the world for the past 2,000 years is, in great part, the story of the epidemiology of the Witigo disease. What he's talking about is what we saw in the Americas. European colonialists came to this land with a drive of conquest and to reap the material goods that were bountiful here. They did this with violence, and with a goal to consume the new world. Tens of millions of peoples and animals. And we, not, we must not forget the animals, the massive culling of buffalo and other species. Life was extinguished here for personal gain, for power and wealth, and it was justified wholly in the name of progress and civilization. Not only was physical life lost to these plunderings and domination of this new world, but it came along with the extinguishment and the devaluing and the demonization of the ideological perspectives of indigenous peoples, that we are in fact interdependent with the natural world and that this planet is in fact our mother. They replaced these ideologies with ones that are rooted in cannibalism. This idea to take all that you can to gain as much power as you can, and one that supports a narrative of white supremacy. This idea has become so pervasive, pervasive it has permeated our dominant culture so much that anyone that challenges this is anti-development. Selfishness is rational, and rationality is everything. Therefore, selfishness is everything. Now, I've been challenged when I present this view that indigenous peoples revere the lands and are stewards of the lands. There are those that say, don't you take from the earth? What about that fish you just ate or the water you drank or the clothes that you're wearing? Where do you get them from? And I've thought about this and my conclusion is, is absolutely indigenous people take from their mother. But does a baby not take from its mother its nutrients? Does it not suckle from her breast and drink her milk? As a child ages, it still takes from their mother her love, her care, her guidance, her security. That does not give that child permission to ravage their mother, to hurt her, to rip her apart for all that she is until she cannot sustain herself. If a human were to do this, there would be repercussions, they would go to jail, there would be punishment, and people would look at that person in abject horror. Yet every day, we blindly accept multinational corporations to do this very thing to our planet, our mother. Through the mining of resources, diverting of waterways, production of material goods, and of course the development of energy systems that lock us into these systems of reliance on cycles of cannibalism, colonialism, capitalism. Even the World Bank states that in order for us to sustain the economic system, it has to grow 3% every single year, infinite growth. Not unlike what's happened in the on with the onslaught and the colonization of the Americas, it's not just human casualties. One of the biggest casualties of this moral and ideological degradation is the planet and our climate, the very things that sustain us. Now, as we're rushing to address the climate crisis, we're doing it within the, within the confines of this ideology rooted in this form of cannibalism. We have commodified everything, and now we're even commodifying the atmosphere through prescribed carbon market mecha mechanisms, conservation offsets, cap-and-trade systems that do nothing to actually challenge the structural violence that has got us to where we are. And allows us to keep furthering this cannibalization of the planet. 
Jack Forbes stated that one of the tragic characteristics of the Wittigo psychosis is that it spreads partly by resistance to it. That is, those who try to fight the Wittigo sometimes in order to survive adopt Wittigo values. This mentality has permeated, per perpetuates the idea that we cannot survive without progress, and progress is defined within the parameters of economic growth, personal wealth, gain, i.e., continue to cannibalize the planet, a thirst that can only be quenched by more and more and more. Even just today, a report came out that the government, both federal and provincial governments, are like, we need the Keystone XL pipeline. In fact, we might need one or two more. We're going to lock us ourselves into a system of capitalist oil and gas state economies. I wanted to throw in this quote attributed to Marshall McCullhan that says, I don't know who discovered water, but what I can tell you is that it wasn't a fish. So we continue this march to the cliff's edge, and we justify it by gesturing over to our accomplishments. The Paris Accord, declining demand in oil, massive shifts to renewable energy economies and systems, all of this seeming to say that we finally are seeing the light and that people are understanding that this planet is not a finite resource stock. However, all of this is being overshadowed by record-breaking temperatures, rising greenhouse gas emissions in the provinces, melting permafrost. In fact, the first mammal to ever go extinct due to climate change happened this year. We see floods, forest fires, rising sea levels, extreme weather patterns, drought, water crises, and the list goes on. And yet we continue, business as usual, build, 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 all in the name of progress. It's all in contravention to the commitments our gover governments have made within the Paris Accord to put a cap on emissions in the provinces. So how is it that we have these conflicting and polarizing victories and casualties? I think it has to do with our disconnection. While many people's lives play out within urban centers, they become largely ignorant to the vast changes to the lands and the ecosystems. It is the people who continue to live this interdependent and in interconnected lives with these systems largely indigenous peoples, that can see the, how these changes not only affect numbers on charts and stocks and economies, but how they are disrupting the very mother that has provided for us since birth as humanity on this planet. It becomes indigenous people who are standing up against the status quo and the perversion of their ideologies of connectedness and interdependence. We can see it at Standing Rock, Muskrat Falls, grassy narrows within my territory, and all of these people are reminding us that we are in fact interconnected with this place, this planet. Luther Standing Bear, Land of the Spotted Eagle, stated, we did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills, and the winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Only to the white man was nature a wilderness, and only to him was the land infested by wild animals and savage people. To us, it was tame. Earth was bountiful, and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families we loved was it wild for us. These systems created here in this country of capitalism, were created outside of the indigenous ideologies, and it was not set up for us to win or even survive. My existence is proof of our resistance. So to break the rules and disrupt the colonial systems is the only way forward. Secretary Ban Ki-moon stated that I'm convinced the climate ch that climate change and what we do about it will define us, our era, and ultimately the global legacy we leave for future generations. Today, the time for doubt has passed. My proposal is that it's not simply about addressing the climate and switching our energy systems from oil and gas to solar and wind. 
It's about pushing back against these systems of cannibalism, colonialism, capitalism, oppression, imperialism, grounded and supporting white supremacy. It will require an undoing of these sick ideologies created on the foundation and create room for a new foundation of ideas that respect the values of those that hold original instructions. We must become woke because consciousness is the only way to undo what's been done. We are the strong. We are the resilient. We are the woke. We are the indigenous. Our body and spirit worn by the land, our minds nourished by the living earth. We are the reimagined to today. We are the visionaries to tomorrow. We are the keepers of the ancestors. We are the woke. Is it too late? Just got a. It's all right. <laughs>